I think it's about time to get underway. Welcome to uh, the uh, only Lippet Ishtar lecture of this school year. Uh, this is a, a much older and a m more refined lectureship than that other lectureship that we have. Here, uh, last Athanasius lecture, I understand there was a knockdown, drag out fight right here in the hall. That, uh, we don't do that with Lippet Ishtar. The, uh, the Lippet Ishtar lectureship is named for a king that nobody's ever heard of. Name of Lippet Ishtar was in Mesopotamia a full 2,000 years before Athanasius got famous uh, for working on the Nicene Creed. Uh, Lippet Ishtar contributed the concept of law. He comes a full 300 years prior to Hammurabi. That's always an interesting character. We don't spend much time talking about him anywhere in the Bible College curriculum. So I thought it was nice to tip the hat to him at a thing like this. The Lippet Ishtar Lectureship is a showcase for uh, Old Testament language and literature honors. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Raphael Fauré, has a long and uh, active history in Old Testament studies. Actually spent some time in Israel. He has modern Hebrew that's better than mine. Uh, for the past couple of years, he's been uh, RAing and uh, TAing for me. Uh, I've particularly put him to work uh, on a project searching for the, uh, the base theme in the book of Isaiah. I've had several other research assistants looking for that same thing. This is the holy grail of uh, Isaiah studies. Uh, we all are, well, those of us who believe that it's one book by one author uh, see a mixture of themes and theses moving back and forth like a symphony. Uh, the musical uh, illusions are going to come uh, regularly as we think about this. But the question is, what is the theme upon which all of the other variations are built? Uh, and uh, Rafi has been searching for that for me. Uh, and uh, his answer to the question you might find surprising. Uh, and I'm uh, very pleased to have him speaking uh, this evening. Let's pray together and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Rafi. Father, it's uh, with a sense of uh, awe, of expectation, that we come together to your word this evening. We pray, Father, you'd speak to us. We pray that we'd understand, uh, make clear those things that we ought to carry away. We pray that your spirit might be with Rafi as he speaks, that your spirit might move among us to help us to see the truth in your word. We pray it in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Rafi, my friend, enjoy. <laughs> well, this works, hopefully. Thank you. I am excited to be here. Uh, I've been waiting for this for quite a while uh, to lecture to you guys. When I first found out that I'm going to lecture here, um, I didn't realize that I would be the Old Testament TA for the freshmen. And so after I graded their papers, I was like, probably nobody is going to show up for this lecture. <laughs> but I paid Dr. Freeland, and so he gave you some credits. <laughs> But I forgot that to pay him, so he didn't show up today. So. <laughs> but here we are, Isaiah's final symphony, The Return of Creation. Sounds a little bit cryptic, doesn't it? And that's kind of intended. You might think now I'm going to tell you some new revelation about the new creation. Maybe that I found some Hebrew manuscript that actually tells us that we can get married in heaven. Or maybe a manuscript that tells us there are going to be dinosaurs in heaven. <laughs> Let me tell you right up, I didn't find anything like that. But what I'm going to present tonight, I think, is equally cool. 
I think it's going to be helping you for the rest of your life to understand the book of Isaiah in a different way. And even though Dr. McMath prayed, I'd like to pray as well. God in heaven, we just thank you for this unique opportunity of being able to study your word here at Moody. I pray tonight that um, your word wouldn't come back empty. And God, even though this is an academic lecture, I pray that it wouldn't just be for information. I pray that it would be for transformation. We love you, God, and we want to love you more. Amen. What if I took every one of yours, every Bible that is in this room, and took the first page and ripped it out? Normally, on the first page, you have what? Genesis 1 and 2. So you didn't have Genesis 1 and 2. Where would you go? Maybe you'd go to the Psalms, or you'd decide to go, maybe go to Job, or maybe you go to Isaiah. I definitely would not have gone to Isaiah. But turns out, if you actually look at creation language in the book of Isaiah, or in the Bible overall, you find some surprising things. For example, the word bara. And don't worry, I'm not going to teach you Hebrew tonight. Just maybe like two, three, four words, but I think you can take it. The word bara means to create. God creates. And it's the only verb in the whole Bible that is only used for God being the subject, being the one who does it. It occurs 40, 48 times in the Bible and 21 times in the book of Isaiah. Now, you're like, what's a big deal? It's a big deal because <laughs> 21 times, that's 44% of all the occurrences in the book of Isaiah. Look at a different word, Yatsar, which means to form. It's a little bit more intimate. When God created man, he formed them, Yatsar. It occurs 70 times in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, it occurs 27 times. That's 38% out of all the books, just in this little book. Another one, Tohu. You have read Genesis 1, because I have not ripped it out of your Bible. And in the beginning, it says the earth was void and empty. Tohu vabohu. Tohu occurs in the Bible 20 times. Out of these 20 times, 11 times in the book of Isaiah. What is my point here? My point is, Isaiah is talking a whole lot about creation. I just used three verbs, or three words, to illustrate that, and there's a whole lot more. However, before I can tell you what Isaiah does in the book, in his book, I have a problem. My problem is this following. I know for a fact there are people in this room who have read the book of Isaiah exactly that many times. Then there are freshmen among you who maybe read it once or twice. And then maybe there are juniors or seniors who read it maybe three times, four times. And then there's McMath read it a hundred times and probably knows it backwards in Hebrew by heart. <laughs> so I gotta bring you all at least a little bit on the same page in order for you to appreciate what I'm going to do tonight. And so in order to do that, let me just give a brief synopsis of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. The first 36 chapters, you find uh, a lot of judgment language. God is judging Israel. He's judging Judah. He's judging nations, Edom, Assyria, Philistines. Every nation you can think of, God is essentially judging them. However, in the midst of all this judgment language, you have interspersed in there little sections of hope. You have Isaiah 11, Isaiah 9. It's, it's a little bit more positive in just like small sections in there. And God alone in this whole section, the first 36 chapters, he's the only one who's exalted. Everyone else is brought low. The next section, 37 to 39, is actually uh, a story. It's a story about Hezekiah's life. And what Isaiah is doing there, he's illustrating what he just did the first 36 chapters. He's illustrating that if Hezekiah trusts in God, He's not being judged. However, if he does trust in Babylon or other in his own wealth or his smartness, then a uh, message of judgment comes. And so, if you will, that's a practical application of his sermon. Um, the next section, 40 to 55, is the section we find the most of creation language in there. This section assumes Babylonian exile. A lot of liberal scholars will say that the book of Isaiah is written by t different authors. And they will say that 40 to 66 is written by a different author. I do not think so, but there, I'm not going to go in there. But <laughs> um, 
the Babylonian exile is assumed there. And so since people are in exile, they traveled all the way to Babylon. They're not waiting. When, God, can we go back? How long do we have to wait? When are you going to redeem us? And so this section deals with the redemption of the people of Israel, restora restoration and the deliverance of their current situation. In that section as well, you have this contrast between God and idols. We'll go into that in just a second. And interspersed in this section, you have the suffering servant, the Messiah, whom we know to be Jesus Christ. The last section, 56 to 66, interspersed in there, judgment as well. Um, however, mostly it's looking into the future, into the, uh, it's eschatological, looking for the final establishment of Jerusalem, creation of a new world and the new heavens. And you might think that wasn't important, but that's really important for you to understand what I'm going to say now. Otherwise, you might be lost. So you can thank him for that later. Um, so creation terminology. What do I look for if I look in the book of Isaiah for creation terminology? Now you might say, well, that's kind of obvious. If it says God created, then that's talking about creation. True that. But what if, <laughs> what if, it, you don't realize that it's actually talking about creation because in English, it just doesn't really show up. And in Hebrew, it does. And so just a couple of things to, uh, to show you that. For Baran, Yatsar, I mentioned that already. Um, another one is Asa, which means to make. And you can make a whole lot of things. It doesn't just pertain to creation. You can make a whole range. In German, you can even make holidays. So you can make a lot of things. And the same is true for Hebrew. By the way, I put the Hebrew up there for those of you who uh, speak or read Hebrew so you can feel good about yourself, pat yourself in the back or something. There are other merisms, um, other um, phrases in the book of Isaiah that clearly um, point to creation. One of them being breath and spirit. The spirit hovered over the water in Genesis 1 and God breathed into man's uh, nostrils in Genesis 2. And you find the same connection in the book of Isaiah. So that's a clear indicator as well. Another one would be heaven and earth. If it says God created the heavens and established the foundations of the world, of the earth, it's talking about creation too. So the question is, what is Isaiah doing? Why is he talking so much about creation? Why not about something else? Well, one of the main and most important things Isaiah wants to communicate to you is that creation in the book of Isaiah, first and foremost, is about the creator. Let me say that again. Creation in the book of Isaiah is about the creator, not the creation. God is the one who is the creator. He says, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and see who created these. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. It's God who created, nobody else. Compared to God, all the nations are nothing. They are, they are tohu before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Pretty obvious. God is the creator, nobody else. He puts it another way, in a different passage. He compares and contrasts what God does and what mankind does. He says on the left side, all who fashion idols are nothing, tohu, and the things they delight in do not profit. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Essentially, God is making fun of Israel. He's telling them, you're creating something. You're Yatsa, you're Asa, creating these idols, and then you worship them. That's really stupid. On the other hand, God, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer who formed Yatsa, you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who stretched out the heavens, and who spread out the earth by myself. The, the contrast is clear. God is contrasting what he does versus what mankind does. And if, he were, if Isaiah were to speak to us today, he'd maybe not talk about making idols. He'd maybe talk about other things that are in our lives that we make our idols, like maybe the time we spend or the relationships we have that we put before God, that we create, we make, we make time for them. And God is like, I'm the one who made you in the first place. I want to be the one that, that you care about the most. 
He puts it a different way. In another passage, he contrasts clay and potter. Now imagine you know how to make a really nice pottery vase, for example. You make it, and as soon as it's done, it starts talking. And it says, uh, you didn't make me. Excuse me? You didn't make me. Yes, I just did. And if you continue saying that, I'm just going to destroy you again. <laughs> well, maybe, but you didn't make me. The point is obvious. I say I was making fun of, of people trying to speak back to God and be like, hey, God, I'm, I'm, I know what you should do. Or It's just stupid to think about it in these terms if you put it in, these, in this language, which is exactly what Isaiah does. And Isaiah, if you think about creation, Isaiah, uh, let me put it this way. If you think about creation, what do you think about? You think about the creation of the world. That's what I would have done too. And Isaiah does the same thing. He talks about creation in cosmological terms. He says, I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and commanded all their host. Pretty straightforward, God is the creator. However, Isaiah doesn't just use creation in this aspect. He uses it in a different aspect as well. He uses it, it, uses it in the historical realm. He says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name, you're mine. This God, who created in the very beginning earth, he's still creating. In this passage and all throughout Isaiah, you have this reference to God creating, forming, Yatsar, Israel. God is not a God that created once, then stands back. He's still involved in creation. And Isaiah makes that really particular, speci specifically with a connection with Israel. When he talks about God creating Israel, getting down in, into the history and being part of it. Isaiah, however, uses, it, uses creation language in a different term, as, in a different way as well. He uses it eschatological, which just means uh, end time looking into the future. He says in one of his last verses, for the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain. God created in the beginning. He's still creating, currently is, and he will create at one point a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah covers the whole range, not just the beginning. Now, when you heard my title of my lecture, Isaiah's Last Symphony, you might have thought to yourself, sounds interesting, but I have no idea what that actually is talking about. Well, I'm here to help you out with this. Um, in the book of Isaiah, Dr. McMath has pointed to this already. We have uh, different themes working together. It's almost like a symphony, like an orchestra, where different instruments play, and sometimes this instrument plays louder, and sometimes this instrument plays louder. And then all together, they, they create this wonderful piece of music. And so just to give you an idea, some of these themes um, is the Exodus, New Exodus theme or motive, motif. Um, another one would be Zion, Jerusalem, where God talks about creating Jerusalem, how he created Jerusalem, how he's going to create it again. Um, and then the final one is creation, a new creation, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so let's delve into that and talk about why, what exactly does Isaiah want to say? Yes, he's talking about God being a creator, but that's not all he has to say. He has more to say about creation. So um, I don't know what is this, sparkling, sorry. But <laughs> it's Jerusalem, so if you haven't been there, go there. It's amazing. Anyway, talking about creation. One of the ways Isaiah uses creation is to portray judgment. First 36 chapters of the book of Isaiah mainly deals with judgment. Let me give an example. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark as it is rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. What is Isaiah doing there? What is he describing? He's essentially describing a reversal of the fourth day of creation. So Isaiah uses creation language to describe judgment. 
And you find the same thing actually in Genesis. If you look at Noah, what, is, what happened to Noah at the time of Noah, you have a reversal of creation which acts as judgment. Same thing is happening here. But not just the world. God is also judging Israel, his own nation. And you will be brought low. From the earth you shall speak. And from dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost. And from the dust your speech shall whisper. When you read this, what, what does your mind go to? I think it's pretty clear that Isaiah is alluding to the snake and going back to Genesis 3. And therefore, once again, using Genesis 1 to 3 creation language that is found there to show judgment, to portray that aspect of uh, creation. Another aspect that we find is the connection between creation and the Exodus. Um, I'd like to read this following passage to you, uh, Isaiah 43, 15 following. It says, I'm the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Once again, God is the Creator. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the last verses, they're not talking about um, God um, taking away maybe your old girlfriend and giving you a new girlfriend, or maybe taking away that bad, bad grade you got in OT and replacing it with a good grade. It is talking about the Exodus. When God created Israel, that allusion to creation, it's talking about the Exodus. When God took the people of Israel out of the land, re redeemed them, and th therefore created them. That's what Isaiah is saying. And so in this passage here, he's saying, remember not the former things. Remember not what I did there. Because why? Because I'm about to do something else. Your future redemption what is going to happen, that's going to make the Exodus look like uh, nothing. It's, it's not going to be comparable. What I'm about to do with you, Israel, it's going to be uncomparable. It's going to be a new creation, a new thing, a new Exodus. And you see here, I highlighted for you in, in yellow, um, Exodus language, and then in brown, a creation language. And you'll see that the two are kind of like going together, hand in hand. The question that we have to ask is, why is God doing that? Why is God going to work with Israel again? I mean, if you read the book of Isaiah, if you have read it, dang, there's a lot of judgment going on there. There's just a lot of God just giving them what they deserve. So why would God turn around? Why would he uh, promise a new exodus, a new creation? I'd like to answer this question by looking at another passage, which is actually full of creation language as well. Uh, Isaiah 43, um, and it's kind of formed like a, a chiastic structure. So you have creation language in the beginning and in the end. In the beginning of the creation of Israel, God proclaiming himself to be the creator, and you have the same at the end. God confirms that he was the one who's the creator. Nobody else, God is. And then, in the next verses, you have God's assurance of protection. He's like, I'm going to protect you, Israel. I'm not going to forsake you. And the same thing later again in, in Exodus, new Exodus language, he shows that there is still future hope for them. He's going to do a new Exodus for them. Going deeper, uh, you have God's self-proclamation, God's assurance of protection, kind of paralleling what was going on before. But then at the center of it all, you kind of have the answer of why God is doing this. Because you're precious in my eyes. Because God promised them that he's going to bless them. And God is not going to be unfaithful to his promises. God is going to stick to his promises. He's, he created Israel, and he's going to stick with Israel. He's saying, you're precious in my eyes. You can almost hear Gollum saying, my precious. <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> so what is this nature, what, what is this new creation though? Like Israel at that time, 
was in exile, as I mentioned before. So is this new, new exodus, this new creation, is it just talking about the Israelites going back to their land and being happy there and drinking grape juice and wine or something else? Is that all it's about or is there more to it? If we look at 4255 in the book of Isaiah, the passage, or the, the sections with the most creation language, um, what we find there is the answer, I think. First, you start out with universal consolation. God is interested in universal, consola universal consolation of Israel, but also of the consolation of the world. God just doesn't stop with Israel. God is concerned with the whole world. That was his plan from the beginning and is still to the end. It's all throughout the book of Isaiah. And you have the same thing again, universal proclamation. God proclaims to Zion, Jerusalem, and he proclaims to the world who he is, and they're going to do the same thing. And then, chiastically, in the middle of this, again, you have the, the section of re re redemption. And then you, if you look at this outline, you'll see that there's a twofold aspect to it. On the one hand, you have this promise of release, release from captivity. Now, if you're in exile and you're uh, not in your homeland, um, it's pretty nice to know that one day you're going to go back. And the Israelites, when they were in exile, it wasn't just them having a bad time there. No, it was also saying something about their God. Essentially what it was saying was that the gods of the Babylonians, they were bigger or stronger than Yahweh. And so God is saying, no, I'm not going to have that happen uh, for a long time. I'm going to eventually release you and bring you back. But however, he doesn't stop there. He also promised them forgiveness. Because why is he punishing them in the first place? Because of their iniquity, because of how they did not measure up and fulfill their calling for God. God created them to be a light to the nations. Just like he is using the church today to be a light to the nations, he did the same thing back in the day. However, Israel did not fulfill their calling. They were not holy and blameless. And so God, however, promises them forgiveness. And then how is this all going to happen? How is this all going to take place? Well, in two ways. You have the release from captivity. And Isaiah here talks about Cyrus, who's being named before he was born. A lot of creation language in these sections where God actually says that he's creating or forming Cyrus as well. And Cyrus is the one who's going to bring them back to their land. And then the servant, we have about five uh, servants, well, depending on what you think, a couple of servant songs in there. And they, they talk about how Israel is eventually going to come back to God, spiritually speaking. It's not just going to be a physical restoration. It's going to be a spiritual restoration where Israel will fulfill their call and actually live out what they were supposed to do. And interesting enough, look at the servant. And in a lot of these servant songs, God is acting again. He's Yatsar. He's forming really intimate the servant, he's acting in history once more to bring about this redemption because the servant is the one who, who's representing Israel, who's doing what Israel was not able to do. So let's move into uh, the, the latter section of the book when we talk about creation and new creation. And it's important for us to not just right away jump to the new creation of the heaven and earth, but kind of build up the context. And if you look at the chapters before, 63 and 64, you'll see that um, Israel is lamenting. There, there's, there are also sections in there of repentance where they're like, God, we really do want to come back to you. We really are looking for you. We're calling out for you, but where are you? Seriously, we're looking for you. Where are you, God? And then God answers to them. What does God answer? He says, well, I was here all along. Only problem is you didn't really look for me. Your heart wasn't really in the right place. In fact, I was the one who was calling for you. I was the one who was looking for you. And then, once again, you have judgment and redemption in these passages. But then another answer of God to Israel's lament is his promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Where this miscommunication, if you want to call it that way, is not going to happen. God is going to live in the middle of his people, visible for them to be around him. If that isn't cool, I don't know what is. But that's his answer to what? To Israel's lament of, God, why is, where, where are you? We're looking for you. 
finally, let me actually read the passage that talks about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. Note how three times it talks here about creation, three times number of perfection. It talks about the creation of a new heavens, new earth, talks about the creation of new things and the creation of Jerusalem. For Jerusalem to be a joy to a place where the people can go and be, be glad. And this close connection between Jerusalem, Zion, and, and the new heavens, new earth, the new creation, is actually something that's really intrinsic to the book of Isaiah. Um, so, so much so that somebody was led to say the following quote, all through the book of Isaiah, the hope for the world at large is reconcilable with the emphasis on Jerusalem as the medium through which a universal blessing is secured. God is going to create Jerusalem to be a joy, to be a place of happiness, a place where blessings will flow out, as it was promised in Genesis 12 and later on. And once that happens, the creation of the new heavens and the new earth is going to happen as well. And the, the question though, or essentially what I'm stating here in, in other words then is that this aspect of creation language, this aspect of creation of Jerusalem, creation of Israel and new creation is something that is fundamental to the book of Isaiah. Mac, Dr. McMath pointed out earlier that the book of Isaiah is a pretty hard one to actually make sense of as far as what is actually going on here. And I'm proposing here that creation is one of the more important ones, if not the most important uh, symphonic theme that you can find there that gives the whole book structure. And now you might think to yourself, well, if that's really the case, Raf, you haven't convinced me yet at all, but if that were the case, well, wouldn't then God in the beginning, or Isaiah in the beginning, talk about the creation of the world, then a little bit of judgment, and then a lot of bad things happen, and then eventually uh, the new creation. Would it be as linear as that? Well, the fact is, at the end, you do have a creation of a new heavens and a new earth, but even there, you have judgment in there, so it seems like Isaiah doesn't really know what he's doing. It seems like he should have taken a class with Dr. Mills on how to write a book. <laughs> but, but the reality is, in ancient Near Eastern thought, the way you tell a story is not as linear as we do today. If you look at a story or something that happens, you look at it from one perspective, and then you tell what you see or what, what, what you want to say. And then you go back and do the exact same thing again, looking at it from a different way, and describing it in a different way, making a different emphasis. In fact, I would say that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is ex doing exactly that. If you're interested in that at all, a lot of scholars debate whether different people have written it to. But that's not the point. The point is, in Genesis 1 and 2, it's emphasizing two different things about the same event. And so we see the same, I'd argue, in the book of Isaiah. You have these cycles that actually, if you all put them together, make a lot of sense. And I've given you a brief outline earlier. This is just a little bit more in depth. I'd say that there are seven, maybe six, uh, of these cycles that you can see in the book of Isaiah. And if you have these seven cycles here, out of five out of these seven cycles at the end deal with the creation of, of Zion, Jerusalem, where it's exalted. And in all of them, it's described in creation language. And even those other two cycles, even though they don't end with that, it's still interspersed in there. So the question though is, it's, if we, we have these seven different voices, if you will, kind of like a, a sound system, what, what would that that final picture be? If you like all lay them on top of each other, like what, what would it look like? In other words, what, what is Isaiah doing here? Well, for what it's worth, here's what I think. I think as in the book of Isaiah, as I said earlier, the most important thing to understand that creation in the book of Isaiah is about the creator. He's the one that acted in history, is acting and will act. He's the one that's uncomparable to anything else that there is. However, he also acts specifically in history with the creation of Israel. 
The creation of Israel, however, is followed by judgment of Israel. Why? Well, because Israel didn't look to their creator. They looked at their idols, at other things. They didn't fulfill their calling. However, God is faithful. He promises a new creation of Israel or a new exodus. It's synonymous, I think, uh, the language here. Because God is a faithful God. And if we mess up, God doesn't give up on us. It doesn't matter how much we, do, how much we mess up. And if you look at the book of Isaiah, Israel messed up a lot. So if that's of any comfort for you, it should be. And you see the same kind of move on a larger scale. You have the creation of the world, obviously at the beginning, and then the judgment of the world, where God is, is judging essentially every human being for their wickedness. And then the creation of the new world. And the interesting thing in the book of Isaiah is, as I mentioned earlier, that Isaiah seems to make the creation of the new world dependent on the creation of new Jerusalem, of new Israel. Once Israel is going to be a light to the nations again, once Jerusalem is going to be exalted again, that is when the creation of the new world is going to happen. And the way God intended it to be in the first place uh, is, is going to take place. And finally, you have the creation of the nation, which to my knowledge is not explicitly stated in the book of Isaiah, but um, for logical reasons, I put it in there anyway. Um, and you have the judgment of the nations, which is clearly there. And then the nations will eventually worship God. When will they worship God? They will worship him in the new creation, when Jerusalem actually is fulfilling their task. And so this is what I think Isaiah is doing in his book. And so if you go back and read Isaiah again, I challenge you to look for these things and see whether um, you notice things that you haven't noticed before. And I'd like to close with this quote here from Carol Stuhlmüller. She says, eschatology becomes the completion, the fulfillment of the goal of creation. Eschatology is the final everlasting amen, ratifying for all time the dependence of everything upon God. It is the eternal finale, the unending pagan, proclaiming the reign of God over creation. In the end, eschatology, the final creation, God is going to set things as he intended them to be in the first place again. In German, we'd say, Endzeit wird Urzeit. The end of time will become the beginning of time. Or to put it in my words, it's going to be the return of creation. Where everything is going to be the way it was initially supposed to be. And this is what I think is Isaiah's main point. And if Isaiah were here today, if he were here today, um, besides the fact that he would be pretty old, um, I think he would approve of the choice of my final two pictures. Um, one of them being this, where you see the sun and this little dog is Earth. This is where you go to Moody. This is where you fall in love. This is where you sleep. This is where you use the bathroom. This is where you write your papers. This is where your life happens. This is one of the biggest stars we know to exist. And this final dot here, small dot here, is the sun. God is the creator. He created you. He created the earth. He created the world. He's the only one that is worthy of our trust and the only one that we should give our time, our love, and everything else. Why? Because he's God, our maker. Rafi, thanks so much. I, I, I feel like pronouncing a benediction and sending you all home. <laughs> but fortunately, we have coffee. So I'm, I'm going to turn you loose for a few minutes. Let's see. I guess the most fun for me of uh, teaching 
and I've been doing this for 40 years, is watching people come to the point that they can stand and deliver very sophisticated stuff in a very understandable way. This is exciting. Not everybody learns how to do this. Uh, not everybody gets there. But um, I'm very pleased with, uh, with Rafi's presentation. However, <laughs> it occurs to me that there might be some questions, uh, some follow-ups on minor points where we might disagree with your take on the book. So I'm going to open this up to the entire group. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, that's what this microphone is for. I don't, if we need a second microphone, I'll get that, but uh, for now I'll just walk around with one, one microphone. Uh, to get us started, I'm, I'm going to ask what seems to me a fairly obvious question. Uh, Isaiah talks a lot about creation. That's clear that that's a major theme. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make in biblical theology if the creation of the world in the beginning and the new creation of the heavens and the earth and Jerusalem and whatnot at the end are understood literally or figuratively? Well, um, before I answer that, I um, just want to point out, uh, it might be obvious, but Isaiah was not a contemporary of Charles Darwin. And so he was not interested in evolution theory. And that's not something that he deals with. If Isaiah speaks about creation, specifically creation in a cosmological term, he's using the exact language that is used in, in the first book of Genesis. Not, however, more so, he uses, the, if you look at the words he uses, the, 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 the syntax, like the, the breakdown of like when he uses what word, it actually follows the record of Genesis 1. And so what I'm saying here, Isaiah, first of all, was written after Genesis 1, and then Isaiah takes Genesis 1 literally. And then what I'd say in response to your question is that if Isaiah takes Genesis 1 literally, he's thinking about an actual creation of the world, not just something that metaphorical, metaphorically um, can help us to appreciate God, then he will also take the new creation of the heavens and the earth and the new creation of Jerusalem really literally. Um, so that, that would be my response to that question. Well, I'd like to ask a question. Thank you. Hey, Rafi, thanks for that. Um, so after taking Daniel and Revelation with McMath, I have a very clear compartment in my mind of the Millennial Kingdom and then of the new creation. And so... Um, kind of asking the question of how does premillennialism fit into kind of what you talked about, because you talked a lot about the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. But what does any of that apply to uh, the premillennial kingdom? Uh, or how, how do you see that occurring in Isaiah? That's a really good question. So let's actually look in the Bible. Um, if you have a Bible here, turn to Isaiah 65. Just going to look at one of those passages that I actually mentioned, but we're actually going to read on 65 verses 17 and following. It says here, 65, 17 following, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Wait a second. Did you read that? People are actually going to die in the new heavens and the new earth? Did you get that connection? He just talked about the new heavens and the new earth, and then four verses later, he talks about people dying there. So is he saying here that we're actually going to die in heaven again? And that goes exactly back to your question. Um, I don't think that the perception of the Jewish mind 
you didn't have, as we, um, I'm not going to explain it, but premillennialism, the concept we have of premillennialism today was not a concept that was the same way back then. All that was anticipated back then was the current age, which was the evil age, and the future age, which was God's age, the kingdom of God, that was promised from the very beginning, Genesis 12 and the Vedic kingdom, all throughout the scripture, it's more specifically illustrated what it actually is going to look like, but it just looked like this. There's the present time, and then there's going to be the kingdom of God. And so for Isaiah, to, make it, to say it really simply, I don't think he knew about the distinction between a millennium and the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, but that, that was really good. Um, so I was just wondering, how does the passages with the suffering servant tie into the creation theme? Is that like a side theme that he, that he steps out on, or does that tie in in a, in a particular way? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, look at Isaiah 44. If, if you look at the, the servant songs, um, you, you have this, this going back and forth between an individual and Israel being a servant as well. Um, and so, for example, here in 44, I think talking about Israel, it, it's using creation language pretty explicitly in verse 1. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. So in that sense, the servant, is, its creation language is tied in there right away. And the servant, as we know, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as he was promised by Isaiah, he is nothing but the representative of the whole nation. And so that going back and forth between the individual and the corporate servant of Israel, I think that's pretty intentional because Isaiah is trying to make the point, this one individual, this one servant is actually going to do what the nation didn't do. And so you've, I would say, to answer your question really specifically, I'd say it's not a main point that creation and the servant are uh, really closely linked, but um, it's definitely there um, and, and part of it. Who's got one? Right over here. Thank you. Um, my question is, is in relation to Genesis, um, while everything that you said was beautifully stated, um, and we can really see the research that you put into it, um, other than a newfound appreciation for Isaiah, my question then is, so what? What is the purpose, I mean, in the sense of does it change or add anything new to what we understand about Genesis and creation, or is it just another place that is found? Let me put it this way. Uh, why are you here at Moody? You're here to study the Word of God, right? And so when you study the Word of God, obviously you try to understand it. And the book of Isaiah has been called the Romans of the Old Testament. One of the <coughs> the hard nuts, if you will, of the Old Testament is really difficult to understand. And so for us to wrap around the mind of what is going on there um, helps us in understanding uh, the book of Isaiah, helps us in understanding the mind of God. And so in that way, yes, it doesn't, as I said in the beginning, it doesn't reveal anything new that we didn't know before, but it helps us understand God and his word, which is what most of us, I think, are here for. Okay, that, uh, that Isaiah is trying to tie together all of biblical revelation, that he's trying to make one big symphony out of all of the major themes of, uh, of Scripture up to that point. I, I don't think I'd go that far. Um, I think that he, he's definitely tying together a lot of things. Um, okay. I don't think that, yeah... That's a tricky question. <laughs> I, I, I think your chart uh, 
tying together creation, new creation, shows how Isaiah sits in the center as a fulcrum between the Old Testament themes and the New Testament themes. Uh, really, Isaiah perhaps was trying to be the key to our understanding of the whole thing. But then that's just me. I understand in Genesis, uh, creation is described as ex nihilio, I think, meaning uh, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Does the creation of the new heaven and earth, is that described as the same way, or is it described differently? And if it's described dif differently, what is it described as? Mm -hmm. um, actually, if you look at Genesis 1, the way we understand creation out of nothing is not explicitly there in the text. Um, you have the word bara, which I mentioned earlier, which is only what God does. None of us can bara. Only God baras. He <laughs> he's the only one who's able of doing that. But however, to say then that bara automatically means out of nothing, essentially we don't know that. It might be possible, but it doesn't need to be. However, what I will say though, creation of new heavens and new earth, the exact same word is used. And so, take that for what it's worth. Probably out of so whatever God was doing in Genesis 1, he's also doing yeah. in Isaiah 66. Exactly. And in the end of the book of Revelation. That is true. Um, it seems to me that uh, sometimes we take things literally that we shouldn't take literally, and then other times we fail to take things literally that we should take literally. Are there any specific examples in Isaiah of things that you think we should make a point of understanding we should take this literally, but we should take this symbolically? Hmm. Well, um, that's a tough one too. I think that, and that hits with a lot of I don't know whether you realize that, but that's a huge question. That's, that's a question, depending on that question, it will determine a lot of your theology of how you understand God's relation to man and how you understand Isaiah and his whole salvific plan. And so um, I think, especially if you go to poetic books like the book of Isaiah, we gotta recognize as evangelicals, even though we like to take as much as we can literally, we gotta recognize that there's poetry in there which describes things in matters that are not to be taken literally. For example, it talks about at the new creation, new, new heavens and new earth, the, the nature, the trees and the flowers will worship God. Now, do I think that they will actually like open their mouth and, and worship God? I don't think so. But maybe there's a different aspect to it. But I think it's, it's just proclaiming that the groaning of Romans 8 of all creation will eventually end. And so I think, in a way, I wouldn't take that literally, if you will, but um, it, there's still a literal sense to it, if that makes sense. It's not as if you can read anything into it, just as you wish. You're making the, um, uh, the classic distinction between the literal understanding of a figurative uh, passage and wooden literalism. Exactly. So the... the the trees and the plants worshiping God doesn't demand that they learn how to sing. Yeah. Okay. My question kind of goes in the same direction. Um, a lot of the, the church fathers, I feel like they, they try to set up rules of how can they, uh, how, how to un de determine which part to take literal, which part to take figuratively. And, a lot of it's, a lot of it really seems quite weird <laughs> when you read uh, the Church Fathers' interpretation of Isaiah and stuff like that. And so maybe I'm asking for for your rules. Do you have any specific rules of like how how if you if you read the book Isaiah and you've read it a lot, um, how how do you determine whether you take something as a literal interpret or whether you interpret something literal or figuratively? Um, I think hmm, how to best approach that. I think that. One of the, the ways I do that is by just reading it and then see whether it makes sense, literally. If I, if I then run across a passage where it says, this here talks about, again, the trees worshiping, singing to God, then I don't think that can be taken, then I would 
say that it's not to be taken wooden literally. It's making a, still a statement, which is supposed to be understood literally, but not in the in the the close sense of the text. That was really a bad explanation. Sorry. <laughs> Does that help anything? And I think if you, especially if you talk about the church fathers, like, I mean, you've read them a lot, I know that for a fact, but um, they tend to try to make a point and then just look through the Bible and see what kind of fits what they want to say and then make it somehow work. And so I would not try to do that. <laughs> yeah, you might disagree with that. <laughs> There's a reason that we call this Olympic Ishtar lectures instead of Athanasius. We don't pay any attention to the fathers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rafi, I'm going to set you up here. <clears throat> Does your understanding of Isaiah's symphonic nature here in this uh, discussion, does that impact the church's view of Israel? Ooh. <laughs> um, let's put it this way. I think that... <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> I think that to understand Isaiah in terms of amillennialism, to, to say that um, Isaiah um, didn't think that there was a literal future of Israel. There was really a restoration of the nation of Israel. It's really, really hard to read and to make sense of Isaiah without understanding it that way. It really, really is. And so, yes, um, I think it does um, actually make an argument for the distinction between the church and Israel, that there still is a future for Israel. And then I go back to what I said in the presentation that once Israel is in that place again where they worship God, when they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as, uh, as, as you find in the gospel, when they finally accept their Messiah, that's when Jesus will come back and then finally establish what they were waiting for in the first place. So, and I think Isaiah helps in that, helps in understanding that. Um, so I'm curious of, you were talking about premillennialism, pre sorry, um, beforehand, um, and that Israel, that was not a concept understood at that time because it's a New Testament concept. So then the comparison of Isaiah with the John's revelation, like this, those co concepts of like the ages, like after our age right now, like what are the connections or the similes there? Yeah. That's a good question. So uh, I, I'm assuming that many of you are aware of Revelation 21 and 20 as well. 20 talks about a millennium, a thousand years of the reign of Christ. And then 21 <coughs> talks about the creation of the new heavens and new earth, obviously connecting it back to Isaiah, which I think makes another argument for understanding it literally. Um, and I guess what I'd say is that Isaiah, he... Um, his, the distinction is made, that is made in Revelation was not something that he was aware of. In fact, if you look at another passage, Isaiah 25, there it speaks about the, the new conditions, the peaceful life where animals live together, and then it says death will be no more. And then in Isaiah 65, you have people dying. And so you have even that within the book of Isaiah where you're kind of like, how, was that? how does that make sense? And and I think the way it doesn't make sense is by recognizing that revelation of Scripture is progressive. God progressively revealed what he's going to do. And in Revelation 20, he revealed that his kingdom is going to be a thousand years. Nobody knew that beforehand. They were waiting for the kingdom of God, but weren't aware that it was a thousand years. Does that answer your question? Um. To follow that up, what you were saying, so then what you're trying to say is that Revelation is a continuation of what the Lord was like revealing to his people, I, like Isaiah specifically, just later time. Yes. Um, and you, there are actually many examples in Scripture where you, where you see that things weren't known before. For example, you look at uh, Jesus 
going into the synagogue and quoting Isaiah 61 and then stopping in the middle of the sentence. In the middle of a sentence, and then the second part of the sentence, the, oh, sorry, the first part of the sentence talks about the Messiah coming, then the second part talks about the Messiah coming in judgment. And he stops right there and he says, today in your hearing these words have been fulfilled. And he doesn't read the rest. Today we know when Christ comes back, he will come in judgment. Did you see him know that? I don't think he did. Um, a question about Isaiah 9, 6, talking about the son who's going to be born, who's going to be called um, Mighty God. What do you think uh, Isaiah's understanding of that individual was? And did he see true divinity within him? And would he have been close to maybe our understanding of the hypostatic union? Sorry, can you say that again? Isaiah 9. Uh, yeah. Let me read it for you. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we see this child being born, but also being called Mighty God, which today we, um, I know, I know I, me, other people who are in the church today, will point to there and say that's fulfilled in Christ, and that talks about his humanity being born, but then also his divinity being called Mighty God, um, what do you think Isaiah understands about the individual who he's prophesying about? Hmm. I think if you, <clears throat> if you look in the context of Isaiah 9, you have Isaiah 7, where another child has been promised. And then you have Isaiah 11, where you have uh, really peaceful conditions. And so you actually look at the, the, the Hebrew words, the intertextuality, the, the words they use, all three of these actually play together pretty well. And so what I'd argue here is that Isaiah understood in Isaiah 9 that Isaiah 11, that it's the same individual. And so in Isaiah, that the birth, in Isaiah uh, 7, that the birth is, is promised. And then in Isaiah 9, he further describes the, the nature of that person. I don't know whether I'd go so far as to say that it actually describes the hypostatic union. Um, Dr. McMath, do you want to take on that? Really difficult to read that Isaiah 9 uh, uh, quadruple chiasm mm. without seeing an intermingling of uh, uh, human and divine attributes. Mm. Uh, they're, they're right there together in the Hebrew uh, words. Uh, there are four words that are only descriptive of God, four that are typically descriptive of man, and they're, they're like twisted together into a double chord. Uh, and the, the only way to really read that is, is of, of this mixing of the human and the divine. The Old Testament doesn't have the concept of the hypostatic union uh, that, in matter of fact, the New Testament barely has that. Um, <clears throat> but that would be the best description of what Isaiah is saying there. That's what the, a theologian reading Isaiah 9 would clearly see that. This is kind of a spin-off spin off of the other question, but um, what kind of Christology do you see in the book of Isaiah? Should I say Christological principles? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, that might be too broad of a question. <laughs> Well, um, I think that the <laughs> Christ is Greek, which means uh, anointed one. The Hebrew word for that is Messiah. So if we talk about the suffering servant or the suffering Messiah, that's the closest we get to actually describing the nature of Christ. Um, and so that's where I'd first go and look. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, Isaiah 7 and 9 also talking about that, and then Isaiah 22 talking about the, the, the cornerstone. Um, and so definitely in, I'd say, Isaiah 53, for example, you have it, him being uh, a human, like him being something that, or somebody, sorry, that it's not as if God is coming down in all his might, and, and you, you see that in the text. You, you see an individual who's representing Israel and does what Israel failed to do. Um, that's as much as I, I'd go, uh, as far as I'd go. The question of the uh, messianic nature of Isaiah uh, is uh, huge, and 
unfortunately controversial, and we're not going to go there tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this has been uh, great fun. Uh, I think Rafi has done a remarkable job, not only in presentation. you go right on time. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been great fun.